like to take a moment to um, thank and acknowledge a couple of representatives of organizations that helped us put on this event, along with the Cunningham Architecture Library and the uh, School of Architecture. We also had support from uh, Ms. Kayla Lewis, the Director of Preservation Oklahoma, and uh, Dr. Mary Larson, the uh, Associate Dean for Special Collections at the library and also a co-director of the Center for Oklahoma Studies. So tonight's presentation kicks off a two-week showing of the exhibit, Oklahoma's Most Endangered Historic Places. And the purpose of that exhibit is to raise awareness of the need to preserve Oklahoma's historic structures and places, and then also to share some success stories of past historic preservation efforts. Our speaker, Ms. Lynn Rostashill, is an avid photographer and writer, and she has spent over a decade crisscrossing the state, in her words, go, reaching into every nook and cranny to research and photograph Oklahoma's unique array of mid-century modern architecture. In 2009, she put this knowledge together to help arrange an exhibit of the famed architectural photographer, Julius Shulman, at the Oklahoma City Museum of Art. I know some of you were able to attend that. Also in that same year, she co-founded with friends the Oklahoma, or Oki Mod Squad, an organization that um, um, celebrates all things mid-century modern. In 2017, that organization was so successful that it received a special honor award from the Central Oklahoma chapter of the AIA, the American Institute of Architects, um, especially for its contributions to the community. Um, in addition, to all Lynn's other activities. She serves on the boards of the Oklahoma City Foundation for Architecture, the Art Space at Untitled, and Preservation Oklahoma. She conducts architectural tours and writes about architecture in local and national architecture uh, publications. Her recent book on Oklahoma City's mid-century modern was published last fall by Arcadia Publishing, and it's part of its Images of America series. Would you put your hands together and welcome Miss Lynn Rostishill. Oh my gosh, she makes me sound so official. I don't feel that way. Thank you guys for coming. Um, as Susan said, um, I'm one of the founding members of the Oki Mod Squad. If you do not know about the Oki Mod Squad and you like mid-century modern architecture, we're on Facebook as the Oki Mod Squad and we also have a website, uh, okimodsquad.com. And I do a weekly blog there about architecture and design and all kinds of fun things around Oklahoma. So I, when Susan asked me to talk, she said, what do you want to talk about? And I thought, since all you guys are OSU architecture students, what cooler topic than to talk about previous architecture students from OSU who went on to do some really great buildings in Oklahoma. If any of you guys drive around the state and like this type of architecture, you will notice that even in the tiniest blip of a town, you're gonna find something mid-century in it. It is everywhere. And um, luckily, a lot of those buildings were designed by uh, graduates of the School of Architecture here at OSU. So I picked 11. We may not get through them all. I'll try to go as quickly as I can because I know we're all here for the food, right? So um, let's go to the next slide, please. Or am I doing this? Oh, I'm doing this. Okay, down there. Okay, so you probably recognize this name. This is uh, Bill Cottle. He was from the class of 1937. 
Uh, he was born in Hobart, and he graduated, like I said, in 1937. He was the outstanding male graduate of 1937 and went on to get his master's at MIT, and he graduated there in 1939. Um, after that, he went to teach at Texas A&M. Uh, there was a... he quit teaching during the war and served during the war and came back afterward and resumed his teaching duties. And during that time, he wrote a book called uh, Space for Teaching, an approach to the design of elementary schools for Texas. And in that, uh, he, decide, he thoroughly examined the way schools were designed and thought they were antiquated and he thought he had a better idea for that. So let me show you what that was. Okay, and he does, he formed after World War II. He formed the firm Cottle, Rowlett, and Scott, and they uh, ended up being really the innovators of school design and went on to become an international firm. And there is a William Cottle Fellowship here uh, for graduating students can apply for that and get to travel if they win it and go observe architecture all over the world. So he has left a great legacy here. So I'm going to get my handy dandy pointer right there. That's kind of the way traditional schools looked before the war. Very boxy, very dark, imposing, intimidating, not very friendly spaces. A lot of them were not very community friendly either. And so what Bill Cottle came up with in his approach, he wanted low, long buildings with central courtyards and um, Lots of windows, like a lot of the classrooms had exits out onto the courtyard where there was a lot of indoor-outdoor uh, fusion of space. And it, he also liked his schools to be uh, used for community spaces as well. And so the Cotter, Wallet, and Scott, their very first project after they formed, they designed, uh, ended up designing four elementary schools in Blackwell, Oklahoma. And these are three of them here. Um, the Houston Elementary School, I believe this is. I might help to look at my notes. Uh, anyway, uh, he, the schools were built in 1949, and Julius Shulman, who I don't know if you know Julius Shulman, he's probably the most famous architectural photographer who ever lived, and uh, he came to Oklahoma for the first time in 1949 to photograph these schools. And uh, that one down there is one of his photographs that, and they appeared in the 1950 issue of Collier's Magazine, which I have right here. And you guys are free to come look at these magazines afterward. Um, and really this article in this magazine, uh, a lot of people saw it. They really liked these innovative revolutionary designs. They quickly got another commission for three schools here in Stillwater which I think I included. Okay, this is a really crappy picture, but it's all I had. So this right now is the administration building um, for the Stillwater uh, ISD, but it was one of the first elementary schools built. And you can tell the school on the right was the one they were replacing with this long, low, modern one filled with windows on the left. Another project that they did right around the same time in the upper right, this, uh, they did their very first housing development in War Acres, Oklahoma, which is a suburb of Oklahoma City. And this was called War Built uh, Homes. That's what it was called. And they were uh, done for um, the guy who started War Acres. And these were the first kind of modern houses that were designed in the Oklahoma City area in a large scale. And they were featured in Architectural Forum and American Home in 1948. Uh, they were cited to take advantage of the natural sunlight and also to avoid direct sunlight, the harsh winds and direct sunlight of Oklahoma weather, and featured carports and at the time really revolutionary wall-to-wall -wall carpeting and uh, also open floor plan common areas as well. Uh, they had washing machines also, which was also a really rare feature to come included with a house. Um, when they did an open house of one of these, over 10,000 people came in one day and they sold very quickly, obviously. At the time, in 2018 dollars, you could buy one of these houses for between uh, 98 and $120,000, so really reasonably priced. 
And if you know where War Acres is, all these houses are clustered around the police station. It's the police station and fire department there. Some of them have been modified and look really crappy now, but there are still a few that are uh, in original condition like this. So this right here was originally called the Betts Building, and it's in Oklahoma City as well on Classen uh, Boulevard. And uh, it was the firm's first office building. They would design it in 1955, and it was for their offices. They also shared space with other um, companies as well. And the cool thing about this building, uh, before it was even constructed, it won out over 700 other entries in a Progressive Architecture Award uh, competition and it won before it was ever even built. And if you ever go by this building, it doesn't look like much from here, but it's really cool if you walk around because you actually enter here on the second story and it's kind of got a, a cantilevered entry here and uh, the bottom story is really kind of the basement even though that's the first floor. So it's a really cool building. It's not a Catholic Charities building anymore, that's an old picture. So let's go on. I bet you could know who this guy is because, duh, we're sitting in the auditorium that's named after him. Uh, this is Jack Corgan. Uh, he's class of 19... Oh, wait, wait, wait! No. Guess what? This thing decided to work now. Okay, back to Jack Corgan. Okay, so I have to say I have a crush on Jack Corgan. I think he... I just adore him. And those really awesome curtains, you guys, how cool are those? So he's from, he was from Hugo, Oklahoma, and after he graduated in 1935, he also went to Texas and set up his own firm. And uh, during World War II, all these guys you're gonna real find, they all went off during the war. So all their, all their careers or schooling was interrupted by the war, and then they came back and started all over again. Anyway, after the war, he came back and he started designing movie theaters. And uh, he designed a bunch of them. And as he designed theaters, his firm grew and grew to, uh, at one point, it was one of the biggest firms in the United States. Um, and uh, it had offices all over the United States and abroad. Uh, it is consistently ranked even today as one of the top 10 firms in the US. It's known as Corgan now. And? I'm sticking with Oklahoma buildings, so I could have gone all over the place with his buildings, but you know, I didn't want to be uh, New York or Chicago, I want to be Oklahoma centric so that if you guys are out on a Saturday afternoon driving, you can see some of these things. So this theater over here is the Center Theater in El Reno. Uh, it has been restored within the last decade and it's now an events center and is super duper cute. Uh, this one is the Will Rogers Theater in Tulsa. Unfortunately, that one was torn down and that really makes me mad because it's beautiful. This is the Will Rogers Theater in Oklahoma City. This is also now an event center. There's a restaurant in the lobby. So I would recommend going into the lobby. The original murals are still there and it's a pretty spectacular building. The Hornbeck right there, is in Shawnee. And that, the Hornbeck looks just like that now. They've taken great care of it and it is still a movie theater. And how many of you recognize this one? Yay! The Leachman here in Stillwater. It's now a furniture store. It was built in 1949. And even though it's a furniture store, have y'all been in there? No? Go in the theater. Everything is still original. They still have the original murals on the wall, all, walls, all the doors are the same, the stage is still there, the balcony is still there, and they are happy to let you come in. In fact, I went by there today on my way in just to make sure everything was still there before I talked to you, and it's all still there. So take a Saturday and go check it out because it is a pretty spectacular theater, and if someday someone wanted to convert it back into a theater or an event space, it could happen very easily. And then this is the Westland right here. This one is in um, Elk City. And this one is uh, not a theater anymore. It's, it's closed and it's for storage. It's just piled up with storage, but they maintain the sign. And I'm hoping someday someone will do something with that building as well. Okay, let's move on. Okay, 
This is our Dwayne Connor. He's actually my grandfather, and he's probably the one responsible for my obsession with mid-century modern architecture. And uh, my kid over there in the green is Jack, and so Jack, this is your great-grandpa. So he was uh, the class of 41. He was actually 41, 42. So I, I, he left a little bit early because uh, he was 4F during the war, but he was hired as an engineer on the um, uh, Manhattan Project in Oak Ridge. So he left a little bit early. I think technically he's class of 42, but I put 41 because it was the one I had the picture of. And um, you'll see the class of 42, there were some pretty amazing gra graduates of that class. I mean, to me, it's like the class that should be held up here. And all of you guys should aspire to have the graduates like the class of 1942. And that's not a movie, class of 42 or something of 42. Anyway, um, he was born in Oklahoma City. He, his dad was a professor here as well. He had graduated in 1916, and he graduated from Stillwater High School, went to college here, and um, after the war came back to Oklahoma City where he set up practice with another 1942 graduate named uh, Fred Poesny, and they did some pretty cool stuff together. First Christian Church in Oklahoma City, do y'all know this one? Yeah, you can call it the Egg Church. Some people call it a mammary church, but I'm not going to go there. Uh, so this church, uh, super duper cool. Again, if you've never been in, in this church, you need to go in. It's pretty much all original and really amazing. Um, it, it was uh, an early use of thin shell concrete, and uh, I know... Susan told me there's some concrete people in here. So I'm a layman, but I will, uh, so don't laugh at me too hard when I talk about thin shell concrete. But the cool thing about that was you normally, you know, in, in earlier architecture, you had to have lots of interior supports to keep up the roof because it was really heavy. With thin shell concrete, you know, you could have a roof that was just a few inches thick and it was pour, uh, sprayed on concrete. So the cool thing about thin shell, you could do all these fabulous, crazy roof designs, and it also took away the need for interior support. So it could really open up an interior space and allow you to go nuts with the roof designs, which is obviously what he did here. And the cool story about this was, this was actually the third design for this church. Hang on, I'll go up. This was a second design here uh, that they, the uh, congregation loved, but it was too expensive. So to keep things economical, he went with thin shell because it was very economical to use also. And uh, so when he came up with this design and they started building it, all these architects and engineers were like, that thing's going to collapse. It's going to fall. You, you can't build something like that with no interior supports. So everyone, uh, after the uh, minister said, no, I trust, I trust Wayne Connor and Fred Poesny. Let's go. Let's, let's build it. And it got built, and uh, they decided to do a stress test on it. So needless to say, I think my grandfather was biting his nails for days before that test because if it failed, his career would have been down the tubes. They did the stress test. Obviously, it passed because over 60 years later, this church is still here. And, uh, and it's a really, it's a marvel. First, first church, one of the first church in the United States to use escalators, which, you know, other ministers thought was so shocking, but they did anyway. And uh, unfortunately, this church, it went up for sale a few years ago, and it still doesn't have a buyer. And it was on the Preservation Oklahoma's 2017 and most endangered places list. So this is one we're keeping an eye on. And uh, we will chain ourselves to this building if uh, anyone threatens to demolish it. Okay, so these are a couple other things that Dwayne Connor did. Uh, another use of thin shell concrete was this house here called the Basic Materials House. There was a magazine out in the 50s and 60s called Living for Young Homemakers. And that was kind of like a poor man's, you know, uh, uh, home magazine and design magazine. And they did uh, kind of a case study program, but it was called the Electro Living Program and Basic Materials Program, 
where they would choose 12 architects around the country, and each architect was responsible for using a different material in an affordable home design. So because he had done the first Christian church and really liked working with thin shell concrete, Dwayne Connor got to design this house, which is in Oklahoma City. And I have, it's featured in this issue of Living for Young Homemakers. It got about a 20 page spread, super cool house. It's still there, it's an office now, but uh, really cool and you should check it out. It's in Oklahoma City by Will Rogers Park. This church is a Cumberland Presbyterian Church in Marlow. A little bit more traditional, but it's, it's pretty beautiful as well. This is a house in Tahlequah that he designed uh, for his sister and her family. And it's built into a hillside and kind of angles up and is really sexy. And this house here, uh, he did um, several of these around Oklahoma City. Again, thin shell concrete, kind of a, a very tame hyperbolic paraboloid design, which the house itself is about 1,500 square feet, so it's kind of small, but it's really big inside because it removed the need for interior walls. He did a lot of these, and I've got some plans here of a garage in Oklahoma City that he did that incorporated two of these together, which is really interesting. Okay. Jack L. Scott, I kind of have a crush on him too. He, uh, another guy who worked a lot with thin shell concrete. Uh, sorry, I've got crushes on all these people, so I'm sorry. But you guys are architecture people, so I know you know what I'm talking about, right? You have to have your crushes. So he was born in 1921, and he served during World War II also, and then returned to OSU after the war and graduated in 1948. He had his own firm that was very successful. He had offices in Oklahoma and Dallas. And uh, he did a lot with thin shell concrete also. Do you all know this one in Oklahoma City? Neptune Subs? I mean, honestly, how crazy cool is that roof? I just, oh, I get giddy just looking at it. So that started off uh, as, a net, as a Quicks Hamburgers. Uh, if you guys know Oklahoma City and remember Charcoal Love and the same guy who owned Charcoal Love and owned Quicks. And it became a Neptune Subs in 1973 and it still is. And the building's in great shape. It's really awesome. This one is the Helena High School Gym in Helena, which is Northwest. And I just think that's really cool too. This one, oh my gosh, is that awesome. Uh, that is Paul's Valley High School. He did a similar high school in Proto, if any of you guys know that one. This high school here in Paul's Valley got all kinds of awards, was, a fe was featured in all kinds of magazines, was in a couple of books. <sighs> I do not recommend you go by and look at it today because some bozo has put a metal roof on it and all the arches are gone, all of the sexiness has gone out of it and it really is depressing and will make you cry. So look at the picture, enjoy the picture. Don't go to Paul's Valley and look at the school. Paul Harris. Paul Harris, again, another one of my crushes because he liked thin shell concrete. I think I really love thin shell concrete. He was born in 1902 and graduated in uh, 1925 and went back, uh, went and worked in Chickasha after that. He did some kind of, he did modern stuff in Chickasha until about 1952 and then moved to Lawton where he established his firm there. And that's where his imagination went crazy. From 1952, he died at a pretty young age in 1958 of a heart attack. So during those six years in Lawton, he did some pretty incredible stuff including the National Guard Armory, which is here. And you need to go look at the National Guard Armory if you haven't. It's on the National Register, it was put on the National Register in 2011. Super cool, super mod spaceship armory. The outbuildings are really cool too. Everything about this building is, is fantastic. He also designed the beautiful McMahon Auditorium, which uh, uh, was built, um, let's see, what's her name? Eugene McMahon, uh, he passed away in 1945 and his mother wanted to do something to memorialize him and 
put funds toward this and they hired Paul Harris and uh, it's still an event center today. It's beautifully cared for. It's a pretty gorgeous building. And then this one is the Presbyterian Church in Lawton, also really beautiful. Uh, that, that one's not thin shell concrete, but it's, uh, it's a pretty spectacular space with that really crazy angled A-line roof. If I'm going too slow, yell at me, okay? All right, whoop, okay. So David and Lee Murray uh, were from Tulsa. David Murray, uh, was, he graduated in 1942 and Lee graduated in 1949. Uh, they, after graduation, formed a firm together and they uh, worked with uh, the, a group of Tulsa architects to put together the Civic Center project. This was in the 1950s. And uh, the master planner of that project was a guy named uh, Robert Lawton Jones. And Bob Jones actually just died last month. And um, the three of them got along so well that they decided to form their own firm, Murray Jones Murray. And Bob Jones had gone to MIT. He studied under Mies van der Rohe. He got a Fulbright scholarship in Germany. So he came with a lot of, you know, uh, really great credentials. And David Murray especially was very creative also and a true modernist and had done some fa fabulous things. And the firm stayed together until all three men retired. Um, David Murray is in the Hall of Fame here at OSU. And uh, he got an award of excellence in 1962 from the A. Oh, nope, that's the wrong thing. Sorry, you'll learn that in a second. So here are some of their designs. The award that they got was for the Tulsa Airport. And um, it has been modified since it was built, but it was built to be modified. It was actually designed in 1957 before uh, Jet Air Airlines started service. But they knew that jet service was coming, so they designed the airport to accommodate jet service. And um, it's really interesting. I talked to Bob Jones one time, and he said that, you know, a lot of airports were being designed and built in the late 1950s. But most of them didn't take in jet service into account and were obsolete within a few years. And the Tulsa airport, they uh, created uh, their support system to where it could accommodate several levels being built after word if that was needed and that's exactly what happened as the airport expanded over the years they were prepared for that and that's why the airport today it still looks pretty good it still looks really modern and it looks like it was supposed to always be that way and that was because they took that into consideration this one i mean how cool is that this was the Sigma New House at the University of Tulsa. Unfortunately, I said was because it's gone. But um, that was another thin shell uh, roof design with tons of open space. Uh, you can see more pictures of all these buildings, by the way, on our website. Uh, if, I, if I had two hours, I could sit here and show you tons of pictures because they're. this was a fantastic building, really beautiful. St. Patrick's in Oklahoma City. Have any of you seen this building or been in this building? One, okay, two. Is this the most awesome building ever? Is this, this building of any building, honestly, in Oklahoma is the biggest surprise. It has the best story. Everything about it just makes me joyful. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about it. So uh, there was a Monsignor Canale who came uh, to Oklahoma in the late 1950s. And this parish was, you know, a working parish, not rich, anything like that. And they had a very small building that they used as a school and also um, for services. But anytime they had a big service, you know, it's Catholic Church. There are a lot of big services and big celebrations if you're a Catholic. And I say that because I used to be. So um, they, any, they would do those outside, and the Oklahoma weather usually interrupted. Wind would blow things down. Rain would come along and kind of ruin everything. So uh, they went to Murray Jones Murray and talked to them about, we need something. What we have isn't working. 
And Robert Jones, Bob Jones came out and talked to them and, and he and David Murray came up with the design of a church within a church. And what this is, this is the sanctuary right here and it's surrounded by glass and there's a big um, area that goes around that on all four sides that if they did a bigger event, the overflow could accommodate that. So they could have lots of activities in that outer part and then more intimate services inside. And so I really could go on and on about this. Um, the uh, parishioners built a lot of this church themselves. Uh, the precast angels, they lifted them into place on their own. They built the pews. They did a lot of the woodwork and everything. So it really was, Monsignor Canale had studied in Europe and he had seen how medieval churches were built by uh, the townspeople, maybe over a couple hundred years. And he wanted his parishioners to have that same experience and that's exactly what they got. Um, my group, o Oki Mod Squad, we do tours uh, fairly frequently uh, and I think we're gonna be planning one in 2019 of St. Patrick's heartily encourage you to come see it because honestly there's no place like this that I've ever been ever it's fantastic okay Ed Hudgens and Ralph Ball graduates of 19 graduate graduated in 1930 then they came and formed Hudgens Thompson and Ball uh, Mr. Ball didn't come in until World War II they wanted World War II work and at that time, in order to get government work, an engineer had to be uh, part of the firm. And so that's when they brought in Mr. Ball and became Hudgens, Thompson, and Ball. And they were uh, the biggest firm in Oklahoma for a long time. Uh, they, um, da, 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 da. they were definitely the most successful in, during the mid-century era. They were the first for, firm to have a female uh, senior architect. Her name was Betty Ruth Jackson, and she was in charge of a lot of projects, and she stayed there from the 1940s until she retired in the late 1970s. In 1958, Hedgens Thompson Ball was named number 30 of the nation's top 100 architecture engineering firms, and they had branch offices in Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico. So here are some of their projects. I know you'll recognize some of these. Okay. Y'all recognize this? It's on the A.C. Bailey Turnpike in Veneta. I don't know who did the redesign a few years ago, but it's pretty sad compared to what it was originally. This was uh, the Glass House restaurant. It is now at McDonald's. For a long time, it was the largest McDonald's in the world. I don't think it is anymore. But I mean, it's, it's pretty cool to even now go up in there and, and have a look and be over the highway. And they, there's like a little corner of vintage photographs and, and how, uh, history about how this was built. But I mean, it is glorious here. I don't even want to talk about what happened to it. Um, Y'all know this one, Founders Tower in Oklahoma City. Uh, this was built in 1964 and uh, had the first rotating restaurant in Oklahoma on top called the Shandell Club. And it was converted into condos about 10 years ago and is still pretty fantastic. There's a restaurant on top now uh, called 365, 360, 365 days, but 360 circle, uh-huh, 360. And you can still go up there. It doesn't rotate anymore, but you can still go up there. And it, Founders Tower was built on the highest spot of land in Oklahoma City, so it really does have spectacular views. This building here is also was in Oklahoma City. It's called the Class and Terrace Office Building. Uh, Hedge and Thompson, Hedgens Thompson Ball had their offices there for a long time, and then it sat vacant for about 10 years ago and came down but it's still really cool. I love that cantilevered uh, front. They also designed Northwest Class in High School, uh, which is a pretty spectacular building and has uh, been very well taken care of and uh, restored over the years, so it's in great original condition as well. Am I boring you yet? Okay, next up we have Tom Sorry Jr. and Neil Hill. I can't Neil Hill. I, I want to say Neil Heal, but that doesn't work right. So um, 
Actually, uh, Sorry Hill Sorry was the firm. They're an Oklahoma City-based firm. They were formed in 1931 by Tom Sorry Sr., who I'm sorry to say was an OU graduate, and his cousin um, uh, Lee Sorry and brother-in-law Alfred Hill. Alfred Hill did go to OSU. Uh, then Alfred Hill's son, Neil, and Tom Sorry Sr.'s son, Tom Sorry Jr., both uh, graduated in 1951 and 52 and then went on to work with Sorry Hill Sorry as well. And they did some really cool stuff too. Uh, this building here is at Classen. If you all know the Gold Dome, it's a little bit south of the Gold Dome. It was called 2000 Classen Center, which to me looks like a Chicago skyscraper. I mean, it, it really does with, the, with all the uh, lines and, you know, very sleek, uh, lines of it is really cool and in between I know you can't see in this picture but in between here if you look real close it's got all kinds of uh, it's got a relief on it so it's really interesting texturally as well this here is what Penn Square Mall looked like and was supposed to look like and did look like until some bozo decided to enclose it uh, beautiful outdoor promenades and shops that you went in and out they uh, built this mall to where there would be opportunities for all kinds of performances and sculpture shows and things like that. Uh, they enclosed it, I think, in 81, 82, and now it looks just like any other mall. This right here was Tom Sawyer Jr.'s house in Yikes, Belle Isle in Oklahoma City, and it was featured in the 1968 uh, uh, Best Homes of 1968 issue of Architectural Record Magazine. And it is still there and it is still beautiful. This here is Fidelity Bank in Oklahoma City downtown. Uh, 71, I think. Hang on. Yep, 71. And before Fidelity Bank was here, they actually officed in this building, which was built in 1957 and is also in downtown Oklahoma City. This is on the National Register now and was converted into condos about 10 years ago and is a really cool building. Cecil Stanfield, the wow, class of 1940. I thought he was 42, but nope, class of 40. So he, I mean, this guy lived on a different planet. He did some really crazy stuff, super great architect, born in Benita in 1918. Uh, he was in the Army Air Corps during World War II and came back and started his own practice. Uh, he also worked with Bl A. Blaine and Mel, and he worked with Frank Wallace. If you know those architects, they were OU students. Frank Wallace is responsible for the ORU campus in Tulsa. Have any of you guys been there? I mean, honestly, it's like the Jetsons came down and created a town. <laughs> really great. Uh, a. Blaine Amell was um, also a Bruce Goff student and designed some really crazy stuff as well. And Cecil Stanfield fit perfectly in with those guys because he designed these really great things. This house on top, have any of y'all seen this? It's in Inola and it's called the Acorn Hole House. It was designed... Um, hmm, hmm, hmm by the guy who owned Zebco fishing rods. And so it was designed to look like a fishing rod. And uh, you can tell, I mean, don't those look like hooks? They look like hooks. And so the story is about this place that um, whenever someone sent in a fishing rod and said, hey, this fishing rod's defective or it broke or whatever, the owner wouldn't fix it. He would just send the customer a brand new rod and then go bury the old one in the backyard. Right. So apparently there are hundreds of rods buried in the backyard of this place. Um, again, you want to go to our website where you can see more photos of this home. It is crazy, spectacular, has an indoor pool. Um, and it was for sale a couple of years ago. I'm not sure if it has sold yet, but it is pretty crazy cool. This one here is the John Knox Presbyterian Church in Tulsa. It was built in the 1960s. 
and has such a great feel to it. It's really fantastic. You need to go check that one out. I don't know who this house in Tulsa was designed for. It was built in the early 1950s and it had me at the flagstone. I mean, what can I say? It's gorgeous. Okay, Robert E. West was um, born in Edmond in 1904 and he graduated in 1926. He formed uh, the uh, partnership with Ralph Black in 1945. They were known as Black and West, and they remained a team until the 1970s until they retired. And I will show you some of their pretty work. Do y'all know this one? No one? I, I just think that is the sweetest building ever. Uh, that is the International Temple of the Order of Rainbow Girls. And it, I know, I know, kind of like Girl Scouts, I guess, I don't know. Uh, it's in McAllister. It was built in 1951. It is on the National Register. And I mean, just the symmetry of that, it just, I, I don't, normally I'm not a real symmetrical girl, but this one I just love. It speaks to me. So you definitely want to go check that one out. This was the, um, City Services Building in Tulsa, 1960. Uh, it is now known as the Boulder Building, and it had an addition added to it, I think in the 1970s, but it's very complimentary to this original building. <coughs> and then down here, you have the Tulsa Courthouse that they did, 1953. Okay, we have William Martin Lawrence, I mean, that's pretty good, and Robert Lawrence, they were father and son, uh, Martin Lawrence graduated in 1923 and Robert Lawrence graduated uh, in 1953. Martin Lawrence and Gaylord Knopfsker formed the firm Knopfsker and Lawrence in 1941 and Robert joined the firm after he graduated in 1953. Robert is the only Oklahoman who's ever been president of the National AIA, so he's pretty prestigious. He's also in the OSU Hall of Fame and uh, was an AIA fellow. Okay, so they did this really cute building. This, believe it or not, is a courthouse. It's the Kingfisher County Courthouse in Kingfisher. And if all courthouses look like that, I'd probably go to courthouses more often because I really like it. Um, they also did the Oklahoma Farm Bureau building in Oklahoma City. Uh, which looks remarkably like this today. They added another wing onto the other side uh, in the 1970s, but it's really complimentary to this. And you know, any building, oh, you can't see it. Oh yeah, right here. Any building that has a clock on it has my heart. <laughs> and then this one makes me sad, Union Bus Station in Oklahoma City. Uh, it was built in 1941. And when it opened, they had like a theater premiere. They had the sky, the lights going like this in the sky and really big, they closed off the streets and people came from all over for the grand opening of this beautiful building uh, with the vitrolite blue tile and the really fantastic bus sign. It remained a bus station until 2015. It was on the 2014 Endangered Places list, Preservation Oklahoma, because we heard that uh, developers wanted to take it and 13 other buildings down to build, yes, a parking garage, yay. And uh, unfortunately, they got their way and the parking garage is there. They did save the blue vitrolite and they did save the sign and uh, the sign is now a prisoner behind glass with some bars on it and it's kind of sad. Um, and that is it. I'm done. I tried to go through as fast as I could.